Okay, I'm not quite sure how to organize this episode 11. So I'm going to start maybe giving another bit of overview like I just did in the last increment. The three essentials were that God has this rule that you have to please Him based on whether you just study His Son. You're reading a book. You're trying to put that book into operation. You're totally unable to do that. Every aspect of learning that book requires supernatural power. As my pastor likes to say, the spiritual life is a supernatural way of life and demands a supernatural means of execution. He said that a thousand times. That's why I can just repeat it after I heard it 20 years ago. Now, What pleases God, therefore, is not anything you can do. God is not pleased by anything you can do. Satan's argument to that is, well, if I do good, and that doesn't please you, then you're no good. So, of course, now it begs the question of what good is. God calls good anything he does. Satan says, okay, well, you made me. Wasn't that good? So, I should be able to do good because you made me that's kind of you know how are you going to argue with that so what Satan's that's his jumping off point is that God says he's good God made Satan therefore when Satan does good God should credit it That sounds pretty reasonable, huh? But Satan's presuming when he says that that the purpose of good is to be credited. It's real important to, to, to go over that. Satan's assuming when he says this that the purpose of good is to be credited. Credited. You see how subtle that is? He's basically undercutting, cutting out the intrinsic property of good. And saying that the only thing good is good for is getting credit. Think about that. If I do a good deed for you, the idea is that it's not really good of itself. but only to the extent that I get credit for it. In other words, the idea is, oh, I'm doing this good deed, and it's not doing me any good, and somebody's got to pay me for me to get the good. In other words, it's being done to get something. The actual quality of the deed itself is disparaged. 
Let's go over that again. Because it's it's this this really hits the sin nature hard. Satan is saying to God, You created me. If you're good, then you created me and I'm good. Therefore what I do, that's good. You should credit. Because if God is good, therefore I am good because I'm made by God. Therefore when I do good, God should credit the good I do. So Satan is therefore undercutting good. By basically saying that the purpose of doing good is to get credit. That's saying that the good he does has no value until and except that he gets credit from God. In other words, God's supposed to pay him for the good he does. Otherwise, it's a waste of his time to do good. Now, you might want to know well, where do I find that in Bible? You find it in the Three Temptations. You have to think them over. You find it in the book of Job where Satan accuses God of bribing Job. Job was good and believed in God because God bribed him. In other words, God paid Job to be nice. Satan saying to God that he should get paid for the good he does. And he's saying that he does good and he's not getting paid for it. And he's saying the same thing to Christ when he says to him, turn the stone, you know, speak the stones into bread. Because after all, God is the one who's unfairly letting him go hungry because he was ordered to go without food so he could be so weak that he could be easily tempted. So he's tempting Christ to do a good deed. That it's owed. He's tempting him with owing. There's an owing, and that's what Paul's talking about in Romans 4. Then it's not grace, it's works. And we all we all say that all oh, grace, 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 God is grace, but we don't understand what it means. There's a lot more to that meaning there. And I'm just as guilty as anybody else, okay? Grace means that there is no connection. Remember how I started this 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 episode eleven? There's no connection. Between the Bible you're studying and your life on the surface. You don't know of any. You can't see any connection. Yet you're supposed to just do this thing and that's how God's going to bless the world. There's no connection between the study of Bible and your life. That's the problem too. But you don't know that at first. It seems arbitrary. There is no connection. That's the whole point God's making. There's no connection between the good you do and what you get. Satan's trying to claim there ought to be one. Now that's a real slippery slope. As all of us have found out in our human relationships. Once you start thinking that there should be a tit for tat. I do this and then you pay me. I do nice for you and you do nice for me. I mean, how many of us, and it's no longer a habit, in the United States it used to be this habit that you sent out a Christmas card and the person who got the Christmas card was supposed to send you one back the next year or that same year, ideally. And if you didn't get a Christmas card when you sent one, then something was wrong. And the people in high society really have, this is a real problem for them. They have to be real careful who they send Christmas cards to. That's unbelievably petty. I mean, there are certain presidents of the United States 
who didn't send Christmas cards to certain people because, oh, then that means we're approving of them. Or you sent a Christmas card and they didn't send it back because they're snubbing you. That's the kind of pettiness the human race gets into when it gets into this good, I did good business. It's a real slippery slope. If you're doing a good deed to get something, you are disparaging the good you're doing. You're saying that the good is no good to you, except to buttress your ego. And it's like Paul says in Romans 4. You're, it's wages. You're treating the good you do as wages. Yeah, and the wages of sin is death. Because that this kind of doing good, it's a sin. You're expecting somebody to pay you for the good you do. Well, then there's no grace in that. You're looking for payment instead. Then the good that you're doing is not really good as far as you're concerned. You're thinking that you're just, you know, you're getting nothing for it. So why should you do it? And this person should pay you. You see? It's really fundamental. Satan's accusing God of being arbitrary because there is absolutely no connection between what you get and what you do. And that is what God is saying. Hi, you just study this Bible that you don't even know what it means and it's all just a bunch of words that happened 3,000 years ago. And it doesn't seem to have any application to your life. How's that going to make you a good person? And it doesn't. The Bible, knowing the Bible, does not make you a good person. This is one of the biggest fallacies in Christianity. They think, oh, if we obey the Bible, I'll become a good person. No, you won't. That's not what it's for, and that's not what's going to happen to you. Paul proved that in Romans 7. Hi, I know this great, wonderful Bible. I know it's right and good and true. Okay, but I'm not living according to it. You know, it's in nature can't. He says that in Romans 8, because he's flowing from one point to the next. Romans is a fabulous book. Romans 8, 1 through 10. Not, old sin nature can't obey God. I'm in the old sin nature. As long as I'm in this body, I cannot obey God. I can just know. That's the most that can happen, and even that's supernatural. I can know what good is. By God's definition, at most, that's all that I'll ever be. Knowing about it. But doing it? Living up to it? <laughs> Forget that. Ain't going to happen. I'll still keep on sinning. It's as if I never learned anything. That's Romans 7. Romans 8 is the explanation why. The most you can get out of the Christian life is to know. But what do you know? It's all supernatural. And what does the Holy Spirit do with it? He causes you to know God. That's it. You can't do anything about it. You can't become a better person. But you can know God. So Satan's argument back to this, because he knows this argument and this story in the Bible better than anybody, is, well, so what? You know God. Well, then what do you, what happens? The more you know God, the more you know how stupid you are. The more you know God, the more, the more ugly you feel. All it does is make you feel horrible. Because the more you know God, the more you want to do for God, and the more you realize you can't. And so Satan's saying to God, well, how fair is that? So who's being arbitrary? You accuse me of being arbitrary because I'm saying I ought to do something good of myself for you and you should credit that. And you made me and you're good, you say. Okay, well then, I'm doing good out of the good you made me. Why don't you credit it? Why is the credit instead... based on something I'm not doing or trying to do and failing. How does that make me a better person? How does that make me good? 
why is that worth crediting when it's only what you do and I'm sitting here feeling like an idiot all the time and I'm really not doing anything for you so I'm not doing any good for you you're not getting anything out of my existence it's one great big waste at your end and at mine you see where his arguments coming from so God must be arbitrary well yeah he is is there another way to be what kind of connection is there just know him that's all he wants and he even has to produce all that and the more you know him the worse you're gonna feel because you're gonna see how small you are compared to him and so it's a real painful thing the process of learning Bible itself is painful it's painful because we don't human humans don't like to just sit and learn it's painful because there are all these arguments about the Bible that make it hard to learn. You know, there's all this war over what the Bible actually says and what it means. and It's not easy to learn because there's so much information that's so far in the past and everybody and his brother's got a different idea about what a verse means. And it's just plain annoying to people to have to study it in Hebrew and Greek to find out. And you have to study it for a very, very long time before you actually know what it says. That's why we need pastors, because they spend all their time studying. And they spent years studying before they even get to be a pastor. You know, usually six years, seven years, if it's a good, good student. Anybody who gets out of seminary after two years doesn't know the Bible to spit at. You need a good six or seven years study before you even begin to know what it says. Even if you're, you have a gift of pastor teacher. Okay, but what's the result? See, this is the heart of the trial. If you, God says you learn my son. You just study this word and I'm going to bless the world as a result. That's his rule. Well, how fair is that wrong? When it's so problematic and when all it does is make you feel horrible. Because you can't do anything for him. So he's going to credit something he does to you, in you, with these really huge blessings that actually have nothing whatsoever to do with you. Isn't that arbitrary? Now, those of us who love him say, well, but it's his rule. If it pleases him, that's all I care about. And if his rule is unfair, well, then it's unfair to him, and isn't it up to him to say what rule he wants? It's because we love him. If he wants me to sit and study... And that pleases him, Hebrews 11.6. Hebrews 11.1 1 says it's the trial. The whole trial is based on this. Hebrews 11.6 elaborates on that. Or, you know, closes the point, like in backgammon. Hebrews 11.1 1 through 11.6 explains the story. The trial's about Christ thinking on trial. It's about confidence in word, Christ thinking in you, on trial, literally. Evidence unseen. That's the corrected translation of Hebrews 11.1. 1. See my Hebrews 11.1 1 videos. Because it's mistranslated in all English Bibles. That's the trial. Christ thinking being put in my head. That's what pleases God, Hebrews 11.6. He's God. He's got the right to make any standard he wants. If it's unfair, well, that's up to him. See, if you love God, you, you, you know, so what if it's wrong? If it's wrong, well, it's wrong to him and it's up to him and he made me, so my first allegiance is to my creator. Right, wrong, or indifferent. You see how the the issue is really about God, not about anything else. When you make an issue of your works and you should get credited, then the issue isn't about God. It's a way to rebel against God. It's a way to demand something from God based on what you do. 
with what God gave you. So who's being arbitrary? Well, let's be charitable. It's real obvious that people are being arbitrary when they say what they do you should credit because in their opinion what they do is good. Okay, that's real obviously arbitrary. But you could argue that God's being arbitrary too of all the things he could pick. He says, study my son and I'll bless you for that. I will credit that. Meanwhile, when you're studying the sun, you don't understand what it is you're learning. And it's taking up a whole bunch of time, and it's really difficult, and it seems like all this, I don't know, book information doesn't add up to anything. And it certainly isn't making you a better person, so how can that be good for God? It's not good to anybody else either. I wrote a poem about it once. I'll stick a link to it in the video description. Can you eat the word and fill your belly? No. Is that what it's for? Of course, the truth is that by learning this word, this pleases God to hear it. Your thinking is being changed to conform to his sons. But you don't know that. You can't tell that. But God can see it. But that's all invisible to you. It's invisible to the world. It's not doing anything for the world directly. There's a total disconnect. There's a total disconnect between the Bible and the blessings God promises if you study it. That's a fact. So, both sides are being arbitrary. We're arbitrary when we go to God and say, Hi, I put $10 in the collection plate, now bless me. We're saying that if we do good, God should reward us for that. Like he owes us something for what we choose to do that we call good. And we already went over how that's based on two incompetences. One... That you're actually the one doing it. And number two, that what you're doing is good. But how is what God is doing good? Why is it good for him to say, Well, you study my son and I'll bless the world. Okay, fine. His blessing the world is obviously good. But how is that related to your studying the son? There isn't any relationship because you're doing one thing, he's doing something else. What he's doing is good, but what you're doing is reading a book. What's that doing for you? What's that doing for God? What's that doing for the human race? That's Satan's argument. In other words, Satan's saying, yeah, okay, fine, you're bribing the Christian who studies with this claim that you'll bless the world but what they're doing isn't blessing you isn't blessing them isn't blessing the human race so it's all a sham and you're just as arbitrary as we are pretty good argument huh and that's where we'll pick up in the next increment